In 1996, as a young technical account manager, he was asked to deliver three floppy disks to learn on his return. He had just delivered huge value. Only in 2000, he could join the company due to the start of a local office. Please welcome Head of Security Solutions Engineering Europe, Peter Sankujil. So I am. Um I got a little baby brother. He's got. Uh, he's very productive. He's uh, done much better than me. While I was trying to protect and secure networks, he managed to create four offspring, uh, ranging from three to 16 years old. And, and whenever I visit his home, it's mayhem and chaos. Everything, everything's going on, and nothing's going on. And effectively, I, I saw this quote, and uh, it made me realize that there's there's a parallel to the business where we are. So in his home, you know, things are always busy. Things are always crowded. And, and the parents in the room can probably relate to this. When do you start worrying? Right? It's when you don't hear the noise anymore, right? And something must be cooking. Something must be going on that says, this is making me a little bit anxious, and it doesn't make me very happy. We see the same things in our market today. If we think about the rich presentation, if you manage to consume all of that, um, there's, there's objects of interest, obviously. So there's new things that are happening in our market space. What we're seeing for instance, is the, the explosion of cloud-based services. Gartner estimated for this year, for instance, for infrastructure as a service, there's a $35 billion market out there, out of a total of $260 billion of all public cloud services. The estimation as well for 2020 is that it will double. So in $75 billion worth of, of market cap, if we look just as infrastructure as a service. So the projections also say 90% of organizations currently have a plan to be in the cloud and are most likely cloud exposed. I speak to a lot of customers that, that come back to us on, a, on an engineering level and they will tell me, my CEO or my CFO told me cloud first and then anything else maybe later. How do I do that? Because that is a different world from, from, from where I come from. So it's pretty promising, and it's also uh, a trigger for us, a call to action that says we probably need some kind of strategy to think about the, the evolution of our networks. When we look at the, the flip side, you know, being in a security company, you get like a national uh, or a, a nat natural form of paranoia uh, inside of you that says, well, how can I abuse that or how can I leverage that? If you remember the hacker session, the guys try to tinker and do stuff the other way around. So if we apply that to, to that cloud-based approach, the level of anxiety could be that where we came from uh, pretty closed networks and we actually almost had walls around the whole thing, now we're starting to connect those networks and you're basically extending your data center if you think about it uh, if you just open up a public cloud and your data center just got extended and there's a new piece of network and if you're a bit unlucky, that is logically connected. And a logical connection means a lateral extension of where the network is. With that, partners are now going to be plugging in to those networks as well. So if you think at the amount of uh, vectors where people are uh, connecting to what you have and, and what you own, this is a bit of a, a, a point where you could be getting anxious as, in effect, you don't, as Dorit mentioned, you don't control the hardware anymore. There's no way to walk up to that server to unplug that cable or to look at little blinking lights that say something's going on, there's an increased activity or something like that, or just unplug the whole thing, right? The infrastructure is no longer yours. You're basically renting it. And as an effect, what we see in organizations as well is that they don't always know that is going on. We've spoken to CFOs, and the CFO told me, it's a little anecdote, he told me, you know how I found out we were in the public cloud? I got a team of 12 administrators, and each month, one of them expensed the expense for the public cloud. And the next month, the other guy did it, and the next month, the other guy did it. So it never popped up as one guy spending a lot of money. And only at the end of the year, I realized that it was all going to one location and he found out he had 200 servers running in the public cloud. And those servers were put there by DevOps guys. They were working with actual customer data. And then somebody turned around, the networking and security guy, and said, so are you truly connecting back to my data center? And there's no security in place. Nobody ever thought about this. That's, that's not where we want to be, right? So 
With that, we see that uh, clouds do not necessarily always have a silver lining. There is a plethora of examples out there. Uh, if you think about the, the US elections, the whole 300 million user database was posted straight on an S3 bucket in Amazon AWS. And you could approach that. That is actually a default in some of the clouds, that whatever server that you erect is going to be available. Right? That's the, the whole purpose of the thing. If you don't control the access to that account, so, and it's, it's, it's uh, brute forcible, for instance, because you didn't do strong authentication, that means you could lose the whole account. Think about GDPR in this context. Where is that going to leave you as a responsible controller of the organization and the network? And somebody put data up there, and you actually are personally responsible. It is your job that's on the line, because you cannot prove that you did sufficient effort to protect the PII. So this is going to be both the, the, the point of interest and the point of anxiety, where we're going to have to say, you know what? we have to do start, start doing stuff differently than we did in the past. And it seems very logical when I explain it, right? It seems very logical to say, you put stuff in the cloud, you have to secure it. It's your data center, it's no question asked, right? We will provide you with all the security in the network, you will provide your data center, and now all of a sudden it's in the cloud and it, it's not true anymore? No, that, of course, we gotta do that. Still, the amount of customers I meet that are not doing it is pretty high. So it made us wonder, how exposed are you in the cloud, right? Because many organizations are looking for proof. They're looking for, okay, you tell me that it's really scary out there, but it's always scary, and there's, there's the whole fuck sales, and it should really be about business continuity, and how do you securely enable me to do my business? And as an effect, what we did is we erected a little server, didn't do anything, it's just running an application, and to make it more insightful, what we did is we added a honeypot. So for people who don't know, or not familiar, that's like a, a little uh, pseudo type of environment that you can connect to that, that's seemingly exploitable, but effectively is not, and it's monitoring on the back end side <coughs> whatever is coming in. After 15 minutes, we had 150 attacks coming towards that server. The majority automated, because people are scanning the subnets in a public cloud, and if the IP address becomes active, there's scripts. We saw Mirai attacks, we saw uh, brute force attacks, we were trying people coming in with SSH, uh, trying to come in with, with Telnet. And we figured, okay, after seven days, we were at four billion attacks, right? Trying to connect to that server. About 5,000 of them were sophisticated attacks. So they were not just scripts, they were actually probing actively, trying to find uh, a, a way in. We saw cross site attacks, we saw, we saw attempts to, to try and do buffer overflow. And then we figured, but do the public cloud providers not tell me that they are running a secure cloud? This is what, what AWS or Microsoft Azure is telling our customers. Our cloud is secure. Right? So I was thinking, how do I get 4 billion attacks in seven days when that cloud is supposed to be secure? Well, the reason is, and they don't explain that in a lot of detail, and this is our joint responsibility, if you like, that um, in cloud, there is a, a, an, an a sense of, of doing sharing. So the cloud provider is running such a secure cloud, you could probably never run it in your own data center. Their physical level of security is a factor times better than any of our data centers today. They have to because it's their livelihood. Their availability is many times higher than what we could ever achieve. And this is what they call their secure data center, right? They guarantee that they will have uptime, they will be there. Even if a whole continent drops out, they can move the whole thing to a different geo and it will make sure that you can continue running your business in their cloud, which is fantastic. It gives us agility, gives us a, a, a availability. What they also tell you if you read the fine print is you are responsible for your data that you put in the cloud. Now, this should start us to think, because then, in effect, it is nothing different than erecting a database in a data center, right? There's data, there's an application, it's an exploitable vector if I don't secure it. And still, we see those servers coming up, and they're being connected in those public clouds, and they are being exploitable, and we have a hard time trying to, to figure out and, and to work with, with customers to create that security policy. We realize that these networks are vulnerable. We've talked a lot 
before already about the sophistication, about Generation 5, the fact that attacks are not just trying to probe to port 22 and trying to use admin admin as a password or, or root and, and ABC123 as a password. It is much more sophisticated. People will try to get leverage. They will try to find out about all kinds of ways to come in. Policies have not been set. I get requests, what's the best practice in the public cloud? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we don't know. We are in a, in, a, in a phase where things are growing. Things are growing massively, and they're growing quickly, and they're also changing. Every month, something changes in the public cloud, in the way they do networking, in the way they provide services. So in an effect, we're all in a, in a massive learning curve, if you like, to try and figure out. The one thing we set out to do is to give you an ability to say, we don't care what type of cloud you're going to end up in. And my prediction is all of you will have cloud, and you will also have a hybrid cloud approach. You will not have one unique cloud in which you will do everything. At some point, the, the wonderful uh, um, promises that are coming out of cloud, like software-defined networking, the ability to do everything in a software-controlled policy, the, the, the auto-scaling and the fact that it's, that it's agile, you use it when you need to, and you dump it when you don't need it anymore. The tr transition from uh, consuming rather than investing and owning is, is a massive change, and it's, it's going to take time. Organizations are going to be looking at that. We're also going to be seeing things like account hijacking. What happens if somebody takes your Azure account? If you're running an infrastructure as a service and you're doing your monthly compute on, on, on the big data that you're owning, and somebody says, guess what? I just found out your password. The data is now mine. That's a bit of a, a challenge that we're looking for. So all of the regular attacks are in place. We need technologies like IPS. We need technologies that will look into the network-based traffic. But on top of that, we also see that there's new attack vectors, such as, for instance, uh, account hijacking. We also see that public cloud providers are not really providing us with tools that allow us to properly monitor what's going on. And that's more specifically so because the, the networking works differently. If a DevOps guy connects an interface to an element in the cloud, that could very well mean that he finally gets what he needs, which is, I am now connected. Wonderful. Did you think about the fact that you connected straight onto the internet? And as we saw in the, in the, in the Honeypot example, it takes about 15 minutes before a, 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 a weak password is going to be abused. So we figure it is time for some sunblock. We figure probably Checkpoint can be your sunscreen level 50 applying to your networks and uh, make sure that you can do both. Right? You want to have the, the beauty of running stuff in the cloud and at the same time feeling that you're running a, a protected shop. And uh, again, GDPR is going to be a massive driver in that. I'm, I'm pretty convinced about that. So we created some recommendations for you. So number one, we obviously need an ability to uh, have a comprehensive approach towards the attacks. Whatever is coming up, all of the technologies that we're developing, everything that the RIT's been showing is going to be available in every piece of software that we deploy, whether that's on a physical gateway or it's running in a cloud instance. The, um, the, um, the fact that it's all in software and it's all in a provisioned environment also means we can start working on making that easier to operate. We can start branching out. Security will no longer be a silo. Security will effectively become something that you can insert into a data flow. So if you think about software-defined networking, which is what we do in the cloud, data is passing by. And you control, based on your software policy, in what direction the policy is going to go. So, sorry, the data is going to go. And you also decide at which point you want to start inserting a specific service. You can, so you can be much more flexible on what traffic you want to apply what security technology. So this is actually bringing promises that we never had in physical networks because we simply had to be that bump in the wire. Nothing like that is the case when we look at a public cloud. I specifically like item number three, which is consumption and contribution. On one hand, you don't want your security guys to start creating all kinds of objects because it's other people, or maybe it's an automated process creating the information that you need to, at some, some point, start pulling in. So leveraging that API means we can consume the information we obtained from the cloud. Whether that is VMware NSX or whether it's uh, Microsoft Azure, doesn't matter that much. We, we built the infrastructure to allow us to consume that information. 
Where the shining part comes in is that you can also contribute. If we find out that one of those hosts in that infrastructure as a service environment has been infected with a bot, we can send back the information to the cloud that says, you know what, it used to be part of this group, but let's move it to a group where it's now quarantined because it's no longer satisfying the criteria that we set in order to be considered a member of that group. So this is where we come out of our silo that is security and we actually start interfacing with the whole surroundings that we have. On one hand, the networking, on the other hand, the orchestration, and taking away the responsibilities from a security admin who used to be a very pragmatic keyboard monkey oriented type of guy punching in changes all the time and shifting them into becoming a security architect, thinking about the larger picture, trying to figure out how do networks truly operate today and how can I make sure that my security gets inserted into those operations, taking a step back from day-to-day -day work and making people sit in the driver's seat, ensuring that even if the DevOps guy does stupid things, we can assist him with the software-based networking and make sure they go through a security layer and uh, we protect them basically from making stupid mistakes. Obviously, all of that will have to be managed in a centralized way, and that sounds very simple if you're working in Checkpoint. I had a look at other implementations and figured out, you know, some, some uh, um, solutions require you to have up to three different management consoles just to do the very same type of technology, right? A, a non-named vendor, because that's Motti's place to say, uh, will actually have a different management console to manage their appliance versus their appliance in the cloud. How does that compute? How do you translate your vision on security and translate that into something that needs to finally be enforced on an enforcement point, having to run between consoles? How, how do you automate that? Do you educate multiple administrators? So it's very important that we have this openness and a uniform way to address all of that. So we obviously introduced CloudGuard, which is the over-encompassing family that says, how do we deal with anything cloud? And how do we provide you with that specific driver's seat, allowing you to say, you know what, I can uh, issue a very similar security policy to what I've been running for many years in my, my physical network, in my data center, and I can translate that, and I can be specific when it goes to the cloud. So that is you doing the same thing you've always been doing, but at the same time, allowing you to also say, but I want to leverage that good stuff. I want to be able to do the automation. I want to create a, a, a self-service portal inside of my organization that says, oh, you got a new DevOps project. Why don't you push here and fill in about how, what size it needs to be? And I will make sure that everything starts getting created in the background. And uh, you can do within five or 10 minutes whatever you want to do. And because I was that security architect looking at how things work, I already provisioned the fact that there's going to be a security layer in place. So you'll be happy with your application server, your database. You do whatever you need to do in the speed that you want to do it. And we will make sure that you do it in a safe way. So this is where things will start coming together without the, 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 the siloed approach that we saw in the past where the networking guys were here and the application guys were there and they never spoke. This is the reality today, right? I meet customers, they don't even know that they have infrastructure running in a different location than the physical network. So all of this will come together. Um, we will need to sit in that driver's seat that says, it doesn't matter whether you're running a physical data center in headquarters, whether you're running a branch office, whether you're running uh, compute on mobile devices, or whether you're running things in the cloud. Whether that cloud is public, because we tend to talk about public cloud all the time, but don't forget, software-defined networking is going to enter your physical networks as well. There's going to be private cloud, and private cloud is probably going to be a much larger uh, uh, implementation than anybody has thought until now uh, because of the benefits. If I don't have to depend on physical ports anymore, and I can get a checkpoint gateway in a 10 gigabit network, however, I only have to inspect one gigabit's worth of traffic, I could get the appropriate checkpoint gateway that will do that one gigabit for me, but running all of the technologies that I need to run, because I can be very selective on what traffic I want to start inspecting. So if you think about that, if you're going back to all of your networks and your personal roadmaps for your networks, think about how do, we, how do I get into the next decade of doing this? And remember, we will be the company that will be there to secure you, whatever cloud option that you will choose. Thank you very much.